Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk ETC, where we discuss technologies and uh, issues related to Ethereum Classic. As you know, there's a lot of great research going on on blockchains regarding uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum Classic, and uh, lots of other uh, cryptocurrencies. And today we have one of those uh, innovators who we are going to uh, talk to today. I have with me Manuel Sabin. He is a PhD student at U the University of California at Berkeley. And so he's going to be discussing uh, his, um, his work. So uh, Manuel, why don't you uh, introduce, why don't you tell, tell a little bit about yourself, how you got into this. Sure. Hey. Uh, so yeah, I am uh, Manuel doing my PhD at Berkeley. And um, how did I get into this? So I'm coming more from the theoretical computer science side of things. I like and to so study... Computer science PhD then? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, it's a computer science PhD. Okay. And I like to study the hardness of problems. How hard are things? And um, we've recently been working kind of on this new area of hardness that is related to much more practical problems. And um, at some point we realized, hey, we can leverage this hardness to get proofs of work. Because proofs of work, um, like in Bitcoin or blockchain, uh, require some amount of work being expended. Um, and so that's how I've got into the kind of uh, Bitcoin world is through proofs of work, um, namely by studying hardness of problems. And when you say hardness, are you talking about like complexity theory, big O notation? Exactly. Okay. That's exactly the type of hardness I'm talking about. All right. So for the pe people that don't know, there's ways to measure uh, the difficulty, how long it takes to, to run a program uh, and how it's related to the problem size, the input size. And I, any, uh, this is, do you ever have dreams of solving the, what the, 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 million dollar problem <laughs> p is, is not equal np or uh, uh, any, any comment on that <laughs> <laughs> um you know i could have dreams of making progress towards that um but there's well studied barriers to achieving that dream goal <laughs> okay so i i know that a lot of problems are uh they, they, they can't be solved. And I was talking to a computer science professor when I was getting my PhD mm -hmm. and he said he didn't think that the, the, the P equals NP problem was one of those that was unsolvable. He said sure. he, he had a, a feeling, it, it just felt like one of those problems that could be solved. So then ever since he said that I've been waiting for somebody to publish, you know, the New York times to say that it's been solved. Oh yeah. There, there's, there's no real reason to believe that it should not be solvable, but there are very strong reasons why our current techniques will need to be drastically different. Um, uh -huh. That our current te techniques for proving things are uh, not sufficient for tackling P versus NP. Okay, and if I if I understand correctly, it is not possible to. It's either not easy or not possible. Period to prove certain things have a minimum minimum difficulty. Is that correct? That's a that's the concern regarding computer security and sure. factoring. Sure. Sure. So it's not impossible. It's very difficult, though. It seems our, our results, um, unconditional results, saying that this problem is really hard, um, have not been uh, abundant. Okay. <laughs> hard. Uh -huh. Now, before we get into the details of your your work, um, I'm curious. What was uh, just? To, I, I like to find out a little bit mm -hmm. more about people's history. So, tell me when you first heard about Bitcoin and blockchains. What was your impression? Did you think this was just a house of cards and it was crazy <laughs> and never going to work, or what was your thoughts on that? Let's see. So, the first time I heard of it, I was. Uh more studying kind of theoretical side of cryptography. And this was something that was kind of off to the side. It was much more practical. And um, I went to some talks on it and 
it seemed so it, 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 yeah it's a, it's a really interesting idea cryptocurrency in general is a very neat idea um it wasn't quite the flavor of things i like proving uh-huh. um as in the proofs of work currently used are namely based on hashes right it's a uh, very kind of there's not much to prove honestly uh-huh. you, you you create a clever system uh-huh. and show that that system uh, works well and that's that was really interesting to hear about but there's not many places for proofs in the current uh framework so uh-huh. i um i thought it was interesting but it wasn't something i followed closely okay all right um and so um now so why don't you then now describe for the audience and is first well why don't we start out this way in the simplest terms possible the very general description of what you're working on sure so um so proofs of work like in blockchain and bitcoin um are a way to enforce that people can't rewrite history really as in bitcoin we have this blockchain which describes all transactions of money being pa- passed back and forth in this kind of public forum in this public ledger and proofs of work ensure that people can't rewrite history by uh, just lying and saying that this transaction happened when it didn't unless they have the majority of computational power uh, proof of work ensures that someone expended some amount of work when they make a statement that this transaction happened and if they're trying to lie they would have to have an enormous amount of power to do an enormous amount of proofs of work yes the problem with this though is that these proofs of work are typically uh the work being done is useless mm-hmm. that is its only purpose is to show that work was done um what our work does and what our papers titled is proofs of useful work that is we give proofs of work whose work is actually useful toward useful toward some practical problem. Okay, so that's that's interesting to me because so it, for, so proof of work at first for me was was kind of odd because you're intentionally wanting to make something difficult. Yeah. And and so and on top of that to add insult to injury, they um, they make something difficult by doing something that's pointless essentially. And so you're so then you're suggesting we could leverage all of that wasted energy computation to do something useful. Can you give um, and, and of course that makes a lot of sense. Can you give an idea an like an example of the type of uh, useful work that might be uh, a good match? Sure. So um, the hardness we get the hardness from. Um, so sorry. Much like uh, cryptography, we we get. So much like cryptography, we base our hardness on well-studied mathematical problems, mm-hmm. and these problems are. So in cryptography, sometimes you have problems like uh, factoring. Mm-hmm. This cryptography system is secure as long as factoring is hard. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of newer emerging branch of complexity theory called fine grain complexity theory that studies the exact hardness of practical problems okay um, as in it takes and it takes quadratic time instead of cubic time okay. type of thing uh-huh. and we are able to base our hardness off of quite a few of these problems and why is this interesting well because uh lots of problems can be rewritten as one of these problems so for example one problem can be given a graph and when i say graph i mean a like a social network you have a bunch of nodes and edges connecting them so like the web of how people are connected socially on say facebook and you may want to um know if in that graph there's a set of i don't know say 2000 people that all know each other. You're trying to detect communities. Mm-hmm. Of sort. So this is a type of problem that's amenable to our framework. Okay. Or so okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. Or also like if you have a network of roads, 
you have points being the cities and you have edges being the roads and you want to find the shortest path between two points then this is again another problem that kind of fits our framework okay now um i could imagine a few people here and there having a calculation a problem like that and then they take the time to set it up so that it could be uh clearly executed on a computer but mm -hmm. is there enough of is there a constant demand you know uh, seven days a week for that type of work that it could be a blockchain could could process that continually sure so um what our framework has then is namely there's three main islands in the fine-grained complexity world and what's been kind of rich about them in the study of them is that many problems can be rewritten as one of those three problems mm -hmm. um, so i'm giving examples about road networks or um, these graphs of social networks but really um, there's kind of a rich framework of work showing that a large a large uh, class of problems can be rewritten as one of these three. Okay, that, and, kind of might, that might remind people of the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was the mm -hmm. NP-hard and a lot of, yeah. if, if you're in industry and there's a, you're, you're trying to solve your specific little niche problem and you think, my gosh, I, I, I'm not sure that there's even a, a simple solution to this you can what they commonly do is show that it's equivalent to a more famous np hard problem like the traveling salesman problem and uh, and then once you do that it's that pretty much you know does it in it increases people people's confidence as that there's no simple solution and so there's a lot of these equivalent problems so is it kind of related to that it's very related to that so that's exactly the idea. So when you talk about something being NP hard, you're saying that a lot of problems reduce to it. Um, and unless all of those problems become easy, then, yeah. So if a problem's NP hard, it's going to be very hard because it's as hard as all the problems that reduce to it. Yes. Is, a, is the point. So um, similarly, uh, we have these problems being hard, in a sense. As in, when I say there's a rich framework of research uh, su supporting these problems, I'm saying there's been research supporting their hardness. As in, there's been, for, for some of our problems, many problems reduce to those problems. Mm -hmm. And in one way, that's a nail in the coffin, like you said. As in, oh, now this problem is really hard. Uh -huh. Because we give evidence to it being hard by having all these problems reduced to it. Yeah. On the other hand, though, these problems aren't that hard. When we talk about fine-grained complexity, we talk about, say, cubic time uh -huh. or, or that nature. Okay. So even though it gives evidence to this problem actually taking cubic time, on the algorithmic side, that means if you have any problem, you can rewrite it as it and now you have a proof of useful work mm -hmm. okay so um uh, just so that i just for people that yeah. are listening that maybe don't know the terminology so sure um computer scientists again correct me if i'm wrong because you're the expert so if like you were talking about processing a, or analyzing the, the facebook uh a network right and so yeah. if, if you want to solve a problem with involving let's say 10 people and then uh, if you want to solve a problem with involving 20 people, so you doubled the, your problem size. Yeah. And when we say it's, when you say it's quadratic cubic, what you mean is that, so you double it, so then it becomes four times harder if, it's, if you square the, the two or eight yeah. times harder. And so just because you increase it by a certain amount doesn't mean that the difficulty increases by the same amount. It could get more difficult. Um, and so, and so if it's, if you just, so this is going to get a little mathy. Uh, so if you raise it to an exponent, <laughs> then that's called polynomial time. And, but yes. then that's, that's already difficult enough, but then people, they talk about exponential growth, yeah. right? And then that's the really bad, the really difficult, uh, situations. And so you're saying that even, uh, uh, you're saying that polynomial, what you cubic, quadratic, that that yeah. is um, 
manageable for a lot of cases. Is that correct? Yeah, not only manageable, but this is exactly what we want out of a proof of work. We want a proof of work to be able to be done within a reasonable amount of time so that you can have a blockchain, mm -hmm. but not any faster. So when I uh, say... No, that's right, because you... Okay, going back to what you said, we intentionally want it to be difficult. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So when I say something is cubic computable or something, that's mm -hmm. exactly what you were saying. It, uh, if I give you something with 10 nodes, then it'll take 10 cubed amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, the point of this being, though, if I want to have a proof of work, uh, want people to prove to me that they've done work, I can kind of set how hard the problem should be mm -hmm. based on n to the 3 as opposed to n to the 4. Sorry, n is the input size. Uh -huh. The input size cubed or input size to the 4th power, that kind of tells me how hard I'm, I want to make this problem. Uh -huh. And um, you can kind of, so you can set how hard you want the problem to be, but also, um, sorry, yeah, Makes so. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Now but it, I'm, I'm thinking. So when I, I I used to have I used to do research that involved uh, the supercomputers, and okay. so everybody from our, there was a network of supercomputers. It was the the National Science Foundation uh, was the man, managers, and people would submit jobs to a queue, and then you'd have to you'd see your place in the queue and wait for your job to run. And sometimes there'd be a lot of people wanting to run jobs and sometimes it was the queue wasn't so full. So would it work something like that? So the blockchain would have a, a queue and people all over the world would submit their, their tasks to it. And then, uh, and that's how it could be continually, it could stay busy and do useful work for people. Is that what you're imagining? Something like that? Sure, sure. So we haven't created a uh, blockchain scheme specifically, but we do propose something very similar to that in, um, in our paper. So yeah, the idea would be you, especially for something as uh, robust as a cryptocurrency where there's large communities around it, mm -hmm. uh, you should have many people always needing proofs of work. And the idea would be exactly as you said, to have a queue of problems where, okay, I, need a, I have a problem that can, needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You try to, you see if your problem can be written as a problem that we have a proof of useful work for. Mm -hmm. And based on the fact that many of these problems are robust in that, in that many problems can be reduced to them, hopefully you can. Mm -hmm. So first, you have a problem, you rewrite it as one of ours, and then you just put it in the queue. And when someone needs a proof of work, needs to compute a proof of work to mine a block in the blockchain, they'll just grab one of your problems from the queue, do a proof of work for it. Mm -hmm. So now they have a proof of work as you would need in the blockchain, but their proof of work also encodes your answer in a very efficiently recoverable way. Uh -huh. Okay, and, very nice. Yeah, um, now, so, Theoretically, uh, the the ideas sound great. Now, as you know, in the real world, then you get all kinds of jokers trying to sure. hack the system, and so I'm in, I'm trying to think of ways because that's that's what anybody that wants to uh, introduce your ideas into their new altcoin, their blockchain. That's the sure. first question they're going to have is, you know, how what, what are the vulnerabilities? So one question, one thought that just came to mind. Mm -hmm. was what if I kept submitting the same task over and over again? And I, I know the answer because I, right, I, I sure. worked it out one time and then I could keep getting rewarded for doing the same work over and over again. I, sure, you... exactly. So um, what a proof of useful work should do is for every possible instance, it should generate a random challenge based on that instance of a problem. Mm -hmm. And that random challenge should be hard on average. Most every time that instance should be hard. Um, and this is similar to uh, the hash-based proofs of work. Um, sometimes It's like a lottery. Sometimes you'll stumble on the correct answer really quickly. Sometimes um, it could take as long as the proof of work should take. Mm -hmm. um, and 
the main point is though that we inject randomness into the proof of useful work. So if someone keeps putting the same the same instance in there, mm -hmm. that won't make it any easier because each time you have that instance, you have a randomly generated challenge. Okay. And that challenge will be hard even if you give the same instance every time. Okay. Okay. So um, and then that would be that would help with the security. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Um, and also Okay. And also, the uh, randomness is really generated based on the contents of your block. So if you try to alter a transaction, that will change the random instance that you need to solve. Okay. And now, invalidate who, any other proof of work. Sorry. And who, who, is, who are the people that submit the work to be done? In your, your thoughts on that. Uh, sure. At this point... Um, we, I don't see a reason why it couldn't be uh, anyone. Okay. As in, you, like you said, you have a queue, and then people just submit to that queue. Uh, when people want to implement uh, proofs of useful work, they can kind of decide how they want the ordering of that queue to be, if there's a payment system, a voting system, but that's more kind of on top of the existing blockchain. Well, here, here's what I'm getting at. So... Like in Ethereum Classic, the miners provide a service. They uh, yes. they they solve this difficult problem, which is allows blocks to be <clears throat> added to the blockchain. But now, what would be um, like the Ether the Ethereum community wouldn't just <clears throat> or any blockchain wouldn't just want to solve uh, my my problems. You know, do my work to make me sure. happy. So they somehow it has to benefit the blockchain the cryptocurrency see what i'm saying so it's it couldn't be random people submitting work it would so you see what i'm getting at so how is it going to benefit the blockchain community i see so l let me make sure i understand what you're saying so um so i i agree that there's lots of useful work in the world that could be done Sure. By by these miners, these computers. But I guess I'm. What would be the benefit? Okay, here's a hit. Look, but this way. Yeah. What, what would be the benefit to a blockchain for being altruistic and saying, you know what, we don't just want to do this useful work. We're gonna help. We're gonna help all these people at Berkeley and in, in, in India. We're gonna just help them by doing all this. Their a little bit of their work for them. What 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 do they get out of it? The miners, what do the miners get out of it? Yeah, um, what is the community? The, why would they want to give their funds for these people doing their this other useful work, so to speak? It's Because it's not useful to the blockchain to do all that useful work. It's useful to whoever submitted the jobs. Sure, this is true. So the, uh, the blockchain folk simply need to have instances to do work on. Uh, if for some reason they want to collude and say, okay, let's only choose instances that come from this company or from this country or this um, what have you, then they could do that. If you'd want to, uh, if you'd want to com combat that, if you want to make sure every, every instance is treated equally, that would have to be a separate system that kind of lays on top of blockchain. And that would be maybe incentive-based where the people that delegate the work would pay or maybe maybe so the whole the great nice thing about blockchain is it's uh, decentralized mm -hmm. right that's it that's its main importance yeah. and that's because you don't want to trust someone with your money <laughs> yeah yeah um that aside delegating work this again lays on top of blockchain it doesn't mm -hmm. really affect how centralized or decentralized blockchain is. Blockchain can continue to be entirely decentralized mm -hmm. and it'd be an entirely separate matter if there's more of a centralized system that creates a queue. Yes. In that sense, people still have, don't need to trust anyone with their money or their transactions and can still do their proofs of work per usual. Mm -hmm. But um, if you wanted a more centralized queue, you could do that to enforce a notion of fairness of who gets who what instance of problems um, are being 
uh, dealt out. Mm -hmm. And that would not affect in any way the decentralized notion of money. It yeah, I'm just... sure if, I'm, if anybody was worried about centralization due to a queue, I'm sure somebody could develop a decentralized queue that <clears throat> synced with all the nodes and somehow avoided. Exactly. So yeah. that, that'd be more of kind of a separate issue than uh, what the proof of useful work offers. Yeah, so it sounds, if I understand you correctly, the it's 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 just it's altruistic if a blockchain decides to do useful work um uh, maybe this is GR. true yeah the, which is fine a, a blockchain needs to do some work and they need to find out where those instances come from so i guess you're saying it's altruistic but um the delegators are doing a service as well in the mm -hmm. sense that they're giving the blockchain people uh, instances to do proofs of work on because the the blockchain people would want to do proofs of work regardless yes. either to mine coins from the block or to just keep the uh, blockchain consistent mm -hmm. so I guess I'm saying that the uh, miners will need instances to do work on and the delegators are almost providing a service in giving them instances to do sure. work on. Sure, sure. Um, and then uh, another <clears throat> thing that, uh, something you said that caught my attention, mm -hmm. um, you were um, you were talking about for security reasons having to add a, a random component yes. to, to the work. But does that, <clears throat> that seems to work against this notion that we're gonna help all these people with their computational problems. Because if I, if I come to the system and, and say, okay, I have this specific calculation I need done, then the, your system is going to insist, right, adding this randomness to it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to say, whoa, wait, wait a minute. I don't care about that. I've got to get this specific problem done. You're not helping me if you're going to now dictate to me the calculation. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, a uh, proof of useful work should be two things. It should be hard so that it's a proof of work. And it should also be useful so that you can delegate arbitrary instances and get the solutions to those instances that you want solved. Mm -hmm. And it kind of seems at odds, just like you said, because we have a framework. There's always been kind of this notion of delegation of computation, where you can delegate instances and get answers back. The problem with that, though, is that um, if you can delegate any instance you want, sometimes those instances could be easy. Mm -hmm. um, so what you'd want is to, like I said, randomize them, but that seems to completely break the tie with delegating arbitrary instances, mm -hmm. in, in instances that you want. So um, what you have to do is you create a random set of challenges for each possible instance. Okay. So given an instance you have a random set of challenges and solving any one of those challenges will give you the instance that you wanted. Okay. And that's the point is even though you have this randomness, um, the randomness is based on the instance you started with. Okay. So, so it's up to the person submitting the job to be done to, to characterize it in a way that is, uh, compatible with your system where they could inject randomness and in, in, in you'd still be happy with the results. So it's good. That makes sense. And sure. I, as you were, as you were explaining it, I just, I, some thoughts, ideas came to mind, some yeah. examples of work where their randomness would be fine. Like for example, if we were trying to factor, right, a large yeah. number mm -hmm. and then your, your system would, would attempt, right, random, random, pieces of the face space, the random numbers, try to factor, and that would be fine, right? And then the hope would be that by, by luck, eventually one of those random choices would lead to the answer. And so there, that's an example where you could inject randomness and still do useful work. Right? Sure. Right. In our case, though, so the framework is, um, so there's no, there's not luck really involved in it. Okay. We have it set up so that, um, if you solve this random challenge, you will be able to reconstruct quickly the answer to your original problem. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So it's, it's, uh, there's other it, it, other limitations. So it's it's not that you could run any 
computation you want. There would have to be it had to be const able to be constructed in a specific way. Sure. So this is not um, a Turing complete thing. You, you can't do an arbitrary computation that you want. I can't. This is, um, this is we have hardness based on a specific set of problems that also have some nice robustness characteristics, as in many problems can be written as them. Uh -huh. But you have to fit within the framework of those problems. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the framework we give also leads to uh, say that there's probably many other problems that can have this, these properties. Yeah, and then as time goes on, they'll it'll become more and more flexible while still being exactly. secure. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's certainly a great service that you're you're working on. Um, and what's the? It, is it still in the prototype stages? Or are there are there altcoins <laughs> talking about using this? So I mean, it's a stage that it's still in the. Uh... Theoretical stage in the sense that we accomplish it in a, in a paper, but there aren't there aren't implementations of it yet. Okay. There, um, we are working on it with someone to create yeah a prototype implementation of it, but um, what we have now is the definition of what a proof of useful work should do, mm -hmm. and how you could do that with practic with yeah with a set of practical problems that uh, turns out to be quite robust okay yeah and, uh, um, I, and go ahead sorry oh, and before this it was not sure how this possibly could be done it's been okay. wanted for a while to have proofs of work that weren't entirely useless uh -huh. and there's been some work such as prime coin or permacoin that find some usefulness in a very restricted set of, um, in a very restricted way of what you want to do. Like you can find larger prime numbers or the yeah. sort. And this is just designing a proof of work that specifically does this. You're not able to delegate instances in this way. So yours um, is more ambitious, more general, more ambitious than the prime coin you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this is meant to for the first time, capture what a proof of useful work should be in the sense of a proof of work that can delegate arbitrary computations. Yes. Now, I don't, this is a, a, a different subject. I know you're not, okay. you're not an expert at this, but I was curious, have you heard of proof of stake? I was looking that up when, uh, yeah, I was looking that up when we started talking about doing this interview. So, so a, a lot of people have been thinking as like you about the, the issue with all this useful or uh, useless work yeah. going on. And so th that, that was another attempt to try to uh, address that, that problem of those wasted resources. Yeah. So, but that's, so, go ahead. so if I understand it, a uh, proof of stake is a way to, again, keep people from rewriting history in the sense of, um, you can't rewrite history unless you have the majority of money in the world. Um, but then what happens is you layer computation on top of it. As in, if, if you want usefulness, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is instead of doing a proof of work, you skirt that issue by instead introducing proof of stake and then just have people do contract work out. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm not prepared to give a, a okay, an sure. accurate description, and also the algorithms are evolving. Um, but uh, but uh, there, I just wanted you to just get your opinion that there are there are other things that people are trying to do. So yes. you're trying to make the work useful, and other people are trying to eliminate the work. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there are things called proof of stake, and there's a proof of space as well, uh -huh. where instead you prove that you 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 uh, use a certain amount of memory space, mm -hmm. and there are ways to try to skirt the proof of work issue by just avoiding work and mm -hmm. uh, proving that you do something else. Okay. And what we try to do here is like say, okay, let's keep proof of work but fix the uselessness problem. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so and just as far as the proof of stake, um, just a comparison with that. Because from what I understand with Ethereum is that um, you can contract out work. And from my understanding, 
that's just work done on top of the proof of stake, just having people do work. Um, what I'd want to say about ours, our proof of work, is that um, the computation is verifiable mm -hmm. in the sense that the point of delegating computation, that the usefulness part of our proof of useful work, Mm -hmm. is that computation should be easily verifiable. As in, when I give you an answer, you should be able to verify quickly that this is the correct answer. Mm -hmm. Because you could just ask me a question. Um, ask me some long question of like, okay, what's the answer to this? And I tell you, oh, it's five. Uh -huh. And you could say, okay, uh, are you sure? And I say, yeah, 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 trust me. Uh -huh. And there's no real way for you to check that the correct answer is five unless you go through and do the entire computation yourself and realize, oh yeah, five was the correct answer. Okay, so now, now that obviously reminds everybody of the uh, NP, right? The non-deterministic yeah. polynomial, which is a terrible name. <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah. the, the analogy that I always use to, to describe what you're saying that you could easily verify a solution is, so uh, putting a jigsaw puzzle together is is relatively difficult but if i was to say look look manuel look i, I did it right it would yeah. take you a few seconds to glance over and say yep definitely I can, yeah I can, I can verify that solution so if some difficult problems are are very easily verifiable and it, like the like the jigsaw puzzle so what exactly you're, what you're saying is uh for this system to work they have to be in a sense like lot analogous to the jigsaw puzzle verification. Yeah, exactly. So my understanding of Ethereum right now is lots of people have to do the same task. If there's a contracted thing, if, if a task is contracted out, people have to, many computers have to do that task so that they can verify that, like, oh yeah, that was the correct answer. Uh -huh. Whereas in our system, only one person has to do it because not each person has to do the task to see that it's the correct answer. Only one person has to do it along with a very easily checkable proof, like the jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, when I give a proof of useful work uh, to be solved, when someone solves it, it's much more like a jigsaw puzzle than an arbitrary answer. Oh, yeah, it's five. Trust me. <laughs> yeah. It's something that like, oh, great. That's the solution. I believe you because I can see right there. That's the correct solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's exciting the, the the times that we're living in. There's all this innovation. People are trying different things in the blockchain space, right? There's people yeah. are trying to, to make proof of stake work, and then you're trying proof of useful work. So uh, it's I'm curious in just a few years where all this momentum is going to end up. You know where we're going <laughs> to the world's going to be like. But you're part of that, uh, helping to kind of push humanity forward in a sense. So I, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, so you. now uh, you've, you've given a pretty good description of what you, what you're working on. Um, is there anything else that um, you want to communicate that I haven't uh, sure. pointed out um, that I missed? So, okay. So one thing I should say is that my co-authors are Marshall Ball, um, Alon Rosen and Prashant Vasudevan. I just forgot to say that, so maybe that's edited to the beginning. <laughs> but um, but uh, let's see, other things. Um, that, All right, well, so if we covered yeah. everything, that's fine too. You don't yeah. have to add anything else. All right, well, um, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for describing your work, and I uh, wish you best of luck. All right, thanks for having me. All right. Okay, bye.